This is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? How are you feeling? I want you to tell me personally exactly how you feel in the comments section right now. Before we even get started, I want one word comments describing how you feel. Are you anticipation, antis, anticipating or anticipatory? Are you joyful? Are you morose? Give me the highest letter word that you can come up with. Today, I'm feeling pretty loquacious. You know what I'm saying? I'm feeling pretty ready to say a shitload of words. That's what loquacious means. I spent a lot of money on GRE prep for my GRE that didn't work out. So I know what the word loquacious means. That's what that did for me. Uh, I've never used it in a way where I'm not constantly pointing out the fact that I did indeed go to a GRE prep class because it's a stupid word. <laughs> it's a stupid word for stupid people like me. Oh boy, oh boy. Let me tell you guys, when I said I'm, I'm done moving in to my house, wow, that was a lie. Jesus, uh, there was so much more to do. There was, uh, there was an inf uh, we're not even done. There's still shit to do here. So I've been busy again. I'm starting to think there's not gonna be a time in my life where I'm not busy anymore. But if it ever is, you know I'll be hanging out right here with you guys on the Young Panda channel. So excited to talk to you today. And today we are returning with what I said I would do, covering more Batman films. Um. The last Batman movie, if you remember or watch my review, oh, look at that card up in the up in the top corner there. You can go watch it if you want to. Uh, if you remember at all, you might remember that I was I, I liked it. I liked it well enough. I thought it was good, but wasn't my favorite thing in the world. Definitely a product of its time and definitely product of a pre comic book movie era where the fact that it was merely comic book was the entire sell. And that doesn't sell for very long. And the history of the Batman to Batman and Robin era Batman films eh, is not the strongest. And the strongest point in a cultural perspective is definitely that first 1989 Batman movie. And, you know, being born in 95 myself, I was not born when these first two movies were made. If I'm, hold on, let me, let me Google uh, Batman Forever. Yeah, Batman Forever came out in 95. So it's, uh, everything around this era is sort of the past to me. It's not the Batman I grew up with. It was the Batman of my parents' generation, really. I didn't get to experience what it was like seeing them for the first time. However, I'm aware they're influential, so we are just jumping in to the next one right now, Batman Returns, which is very similar to 89. Clearly, it's still directed by Tim Burton, who uh, between this film and Batman 89 made Edward Scissorhands. And I don't want to say that directing Edward Scissorhands between this ruined the tone of Batman. However, I think it did embolden our director to have a bit more confidence in his style. So the biggest thing that you can find a difference in here is tone. And that, that's the, that seems to be the story of the pre-Nolan Batmans is a drastic change in tone as they go along. And I expected a tonal change between 89 and Returns. I did not expect this much of a tonal change. It is so much more cartoony and almost removes any sort of uh, proto-realistic, grounded crime fiction feel. It is that, that was pretty light in 89, but it, it did inform a lot of the decisions that were made. It did kind of, it was the cake and then there was a lot of frosting of goofy shit on top and they had most of the goofy shit sort of filtered down into all of 
uh, the Joker's kind of stuff, and then the you know props and settings and environments. It was a much more serious Batman movie uh, compared to this. I mean, 89 Batman versus the Batmans we've had in the past few years is infinitely more cartoony, but man, Returns is a big step into cartoony. Uh, it's There's some interesting other tonal decisions, like everything is blue. The whole movie is very blue, especially everything that has to do with the penguin. The penguin is very uh, cold, so the whole movie has this cold feeling, and it's sort of alienating, and in a way, it's it's like, I found it to be very abstract at times, sort of elegiac and expressionist. I'll get into that later when we talk about Penguin, because that's definitely what I mean. But the uh, it, it gets more cartoony in general and a bit more comedy-ish, a bit more comedic. It's not good comedy. The, the intentional comedy is slapstick, and it, it, that does not work in this it, it, within the film. I did not laugh on purpose once. Uh, anything that I did laugh about is pure absurdity. Like, holy fuck, I can't even believe this shit right now. What am I seeing? The slapstick comedy and intentional jokes very rarely actually got me to laugh. But the production is really the most cartoonish element of it. Uh, we've got sets and props that just feel almost on the level of Ron Howard's The Grinch Who Stole Christmas, that really intense cartoonish level where all of the props are nothing similar to what you would see in real life. Danny Elfman's score is as light and whimsical as it could possibly be. There's just a, they just said, fuck realism. Like, get all of the realism out of here. We have no place for it here. We don't want it here. It is not for us. And within the context of old, uh, a more current Batman, it's it's a bit jarring. It's it's a tad bit jarring seeing Batman in this context. But this was Batman. This is what they understood of Batman, I guess. I didn't look up any reviews of this film. Maybe I should have because I'm wondering what the critical consensus was at the time. Because it feels weird, but it's also not a film for kids, really. It's um, grotesque and oddly sexual and weird, and there's a decent amount of pretty uh, gruesome violence in it, violence towards women. There's some elements that are just not child-friendly, but you have the incredibly cartoonish world. So I don't know how much of the tonal inconsistency is intentionally bordering on abstract expressionism, but it gets there. And it's sort of a, it's almost an out of body experience watching it. There's the scene where the penguin is uh, in his ones, in his uh, long underwear, his, his, his sleep onesie, it looks like. He's just demolishing a fish in the middle of a crowded, well-lit, colorful office room when he's gonna run for mayor when he first finds out. And seeing this horrific sewer monster character in such a positive, preppy, yuppie, modern environment is abstract on the level of like David Lynch's Blue Velvet. I was reminded of the scene where she, he brings the bruised up, dirty, naked woman into their suburban family household in, in Blue Velvet. And for a mainstream superhero movie, that is pretty cool. <laughs> the, the appeal of something like David Lynch would make is to create that uncomfortable, otherworldly feeling of these very contrasting settings and characters. So it kind of puts you in a state of discomfort because that's the intention. The intention is to bring you into a different state of thinking, take you out of your comfort zone and give you something, a new experience. I don't think people that were going into Batman Returns in 92 were looking for that, 
but they got that and they might have just written it off as funny but i found it to be um hilariously abstract and oddly charming i liked it I, again the intentionality is kind of all over the place but there's a lot of decisions that have to do with the the lack of realism that are like eye rolly though it's not all this beautiful accident like uh when catwoman jumps out of uh the building and lands in an open truck of kitty litter which no one has ever seen ever because <laughs> uh, she's a cat a lot of that kind of stuff just because she's a cat she's a cat that's the reason the reason is because yeah it's of course it would be that a microcosm of the entire tone and feel is going to be when the penguin sends an army of mind-controlled penguins with dynamite on their back to go blow up the city. That is our tone. <laughs> that is the feel of this film. Uh, I, I enjoy that it takes it to such a degree that it does feel like it's its own intentional world. And I will say that if I'm going to rewatch this or 89, I'd much rather watch this. I was never bored watching this. I was confused, somehow upset, a little angry at times, but never fucking bored. This was really fascinating in a, in a found object art kind of way. Like, oh my God, this is, what were the conditions that this was made in? Again, it's, it's one of these Batman movies that just because it's a Batman movie, it gets a pass in a lot of different areas it so this it's not very heavy on plot it's it's heavier than 89 but so much of this film's appeal comes from the production there's so many cute things there's a scene where batman just leaves his batmobile out in the open while he's fighting crime and then the penguin is able to get a, a device in there to start controlling it from a remote control and the uh, you know, Batman leaves and the machine he uses to control the Batmobile is a what looks like those little grocery store rides from the like the 90s. I don't even think they exist anymore. He's like riding in a tiny miniature version of the Batmobile. And that is so far into like, there's no reason that should exist that you just kind of accept it. You just blindly like, OK, yep, just bring it on more of that shit. I mean, I, I, did he hire his penguins to sculpt that for him? Did his army of goons know how to invent a, a, a remote controller that also fits in well with a child's toy ride? Um, you're not supposed to think about those kind of things at all. Because if you did, you'd hurt yourself. There is so many of them. The film is comprised of things like this. It's kind of the point. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of stuff like there's a lot of violence in it there's uh you know but it's got to be this weird kid friendly violence so like uh people show up with machine guns and fire into a crowd but like all they wanted to do was shoot the tree on the other side of the crowd so it's the same amount of fear and violence without any of the bodily dismemberment, except until you get Catwoman being pushed off of the building and, and, and then uh, cats nibble at her fingers until she becomes a cat. We'll get to that. We'll get to that. Again, just like Batman 89, we have a phenomenal cast, like top tier actors, A-list celebrities, not just celebrities, but like great cinematic actors. Christopher Walken is in this movie, ladies and gentlemen. He is in it. He's in the film. And he is wonderful. Everything that he says is fantastic. You have no idea. So I knew, I knew DeVito, I knew Pfeiffer, and I knew Keaton. We're all in this movie. I didn't know Walken was in it. When you are randomly surprised by a Christopher Walken performance, that is such a gift of joy. You just get, oh, hooray, I get 90 minutes with this guy again. I'm so happy. Ah, I, I didn't know he was in it. I didn't know what kind of character he played. He plays a bad guy, a really malicious, smiling, evil bad guy. And it is, it is worth the price of admission just for that. 
But then on top of that, you've got Danny DeVito in, I do not mean this sarcastically, one of the best roles in his entire life. Danny DeVito is so, like there is not another human being on earth that can play this version of the Penguin so well. If I'm gonna watch a, multiple movies, with the same character, I'd much rather watch Colin Farrell's version of the Penguin, but this isn't, this is not Colin Farrell's version of the Penguin. This Penguin is the most absurd, over the top, disgusting being that you can cultivate. And that's the, the essence of his character. Like the, the opening scene, the, the Penguin was such an obviously evil, grotesque, monstrous baby that they threw him in the <laughs> threw him in the river trying to kill him. Or not trying to kill him, but trying to get rid of him. But it was a, a fucking frozen river in the middle of the winter. Of course, he's, he's going to not live. <laughs> Whatever. And then he's brought down and he's raised by an army of penguins that live underneath the city. And then he is a penguin. And it's not that he has penguiny features. This motherfucker's a penguin. There's one scene where someone takes fish and wiggles it in front of him to get him to do shit. That's how much of a penguin he is. Number one, are there under other sewer penguins? I'm not aware of. And but did I miss? Did I miss the memo about sewer penguins? I'm not complaining because it fits in with the rest of the tone. It's part of the movie. But oh my god. That's pushing it. <laughs> oh boy, this that was that was like the first couple scenes in the movie is the the sewer penguins, and that is a lot. That is that is a lot. <laughs> oh boy. So by the time we meet Penguin, he's the he's the king of the underground, and I noticed there was a lot of clowns in his crew. At first, I was like, why does he have clowns in his crew? Aren't those supposed to be Joker thugs? And then I remembered, oh wait, the those clown guys didn't have the Joker anymore, so they must have just gone to a different master, the Penguin. But they still dress like clowns, so that implies that the clown outfits were not the Joker's decision. It was just like what they wear anyways. And the Joker just happened to be a decent fit for this clown army, but now the Penguin has the clown army, so it's not the best fit, but hey, we're still gonna do crimes. The entire story of the Penguin is he is a, the scum of the earth and he wants to be treated with more respect and he's, it's dangled before his eyes as like, a, ooh, you could have this. And at first he's like, no. And then he's like, yeah, I'll take it. And <laughs> then he likes the idea and becomes more and more excited about it and more prideful. And he starts holding himself up to a different standard and Obviously, the world rejects that concept. It is Stringer Bell's arc from The Wire. <laughs> and, and this came first. So the original character arc, trying to go legit, failing because you're not destined for it. That Stringer Bell's arc in The Wire, secondary, you know, post Batman Returns. I don't want to say that the, the Wire was ripped, that they ripped off Batman Returns. But I really want to say they were inspired by the <laughs> Batman Returns that the writers of it were like, you know what we should do? We should make him the Penguin from Batman Returns. <laughs> that would be so fucking dumb. <laughs> oh boy. Anyways, yeah, that's the, that's the story of the Penguin. But what makes the Penguin is definitely all of the costume and production choices that go into him. All, all of the characters, all, all of the the uh, costumed characters, their personality is solely based on the costume. Penguin is literally a penguin. There's no need to break down what that means. There's no need to deep dive any deeper than he's a penguin. Same thing with Catwoman. Catwoman is a cat and a woman. Those are her traits that we don't need to overthink it at all. It's very basic shit. The penguin is a disgusting little monster who lives on the sewers and he's demolishing fish. That's everything he is. 
There's no need to get really into his trauma or backstory because that's all incidental. The most important thing is that you know he's disgusting and they take every single opportunity to remind you how disgusting he is. He is in his onesie and that is horrifying. Just him in the onesie is in and of itself really fucking uncomfortable to look at. And then he's, you know, he's demolishing fish. He's making disgusting sexual advances on Catwoman. He's so fucking horny. He cannot resist. He's so goddamn ready to fuck something. Now that he thinks he's the mayor, he thinks he can fuck anything. So this is, this is his character arc. And then he learns he's gonna have to fuck other sewer penguins like himself for the rest of his life and decides to get revenge on Gotham, which is great. It's really good. That aspect of the film is really enjoyable and it, it, it's that perfect mixing of cartoonish and horrifying tones, which I, I dig. I dig that. That's a lot of fun. Catwoman, on the other hand, is has some problems. They in, uh, To be fair, I really enjoyed the aspects of the character that have to do with Selina Kyle, with the actual alter ego, that person was interesting seeing you know it's something we've seen before where mild-mannered awkward cute but ultimately a uh, airheaded girl struggles <laughs> to survive in her modern day life and then something changes and then she's hot and she's powerful and she's sexy and she's gonna fucking rock up rock the world take it down um the problem is Catwoman is so fucking cringe in this. Zoe Kravitz's Catwoman from Batman, The Batman 22, is infinitely better, infinitely uh, more sexy, number one. Just from the beginning, a powerful, strong individual who is kind and takes care of people. Like, she's a very awesome character. And her growth is far more subtle, where ultimately I think she really learns that she's gonna have to take care of herself if she ever wants to continue taking care of others. And she needs to get away from these toxic environments after going through everything. That's kind of her arc. Once Selena Kyle in Returns falls off the building uh, and cats turn her into a vampire cat woman, uh, that arc is over. She is the sexy lady and then all she needs to do is figure out if she's gonna kill people or not. And it seems like she's gonna, she is gonna kill people at the end. She does kill herself and um, Christopher Walken, which was pretty cool. Uh, but her energy, her lines are so gross. And I understand it's 92. Feminism isn't, you know, quite where it is today. So I am woman, hear me roar. And then her back flipping away in today's context is so self parody that I, I was like crying laughing after seeing that. Because uh, <laughs> it is, I imagine a TikTok doing that, making fun of that type of energy. It's, it is, it is gas key, wait, gas key girl gate, uh, gate boss, whatever. Um, gas keep, fuck, gas keep, Girl light, gate boss. Girl boss, gate, girl, fuck. Gaslight, gate, keep, girl boss. Jesus Christ. It is that energy and it is mostly used for comedy these days. Her transition into uh, I am tough now is really funny because she gets home uh, after dying and being brought to life by cats. And she has this super pink room. Everything's pink. Everything that could be pink is pink. She's got stuffed animals. She's got a, a, a pink neon sign that says, hello there. And uh, I, they didn't show it, but on the other side, I can almost guarantee you it says General Kenobi. But once she becomes the cat woman, she comes home, literally takes a black can of spray paint and starts spraying black on the walls. Like you saw where the, it was going, but the fact that she takes out the, the, the spray paint, like the least efficient way 
to paint everything black and they're gonna show you like doing, taking everything, every step possible to blacking out the wall is like the audience couldn't have figured that that was gonna happen to her anyways and you needed to like spell it out. So extremely that I was like crying laughing too. That whole sequence was funny, but what broke it was when she smashes the O and the T from hello there and turns it into hell here. That was just bad. <laughs> that, that killed my joy. I was like, oh, that's so fucking dumb. You ruined the joy of when you stuffed your your stuffed animals into the the garbage disposal and blended them to get rid of them. <laughs> While screaming, just uh, just blending stuffed animals because you're emo now. That mm, 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 that that was delicious. And once she's Catwoman, you know she's she's a sexy lady. She's a sexy sex sa sassy sex kitten. But uh, it's this weird '90s white lady version of sexy, where she's like, yeah, I am bad. <laughs> And then she licks her leather uh, paw to to uh, clean her non-existent fur. Like just like she licks leather and then rubs the wet leather on other pieces of leather. And of course, you got Danny DeVito like jerking off in the back. It, luckily, it got to the point of unintentionally funny, like when she eats a whole ass bird. And I just like I was like, this is so fucking dumb. <laughs> she just puts a whole bird in her mouth. And I'm aware, I'm aware the context of Catwoman being used as, you know, she's just a burglar who wears a cat suit. That's her, I, I, I know that's what I thought Catwoman was. But this is a cat woman, this is a woman cat. And that's, you know, I'm open-minded, that's fine. She can do that, but I'll tell you this, it is not sexy. <laughs> it is not sexy. It is awkward and uncomfortable and hilarious. Uh, you know, I, I did like the Selena Kyle aspects. Pfeiffer's a good actress. It is not Pfeiffer's fault at all. It is the concept of the character. Michelle Pfeiffer is beautiful, but she does not have that Zoe Kravitz, uh, just raw sexual energy about her. And uh, neither did Anne Hathaway, but this is not it, man. This, her, she is much more uh, suited to playing human beings. <laughs> and, you know, she did great. A, a tier actress doing her absolute damnedest to make this character sexy and interesting, but it didn't work. It makes me question if they were even going for sexy, which I know they are. These 90s movies, uh, women are like super not important in, in like a mainstream action -y movie the emotions and character of women is so secondary. I just watched Dodgeball the other day. <laughs> Remember Dodgeball with Vince Vaughn? That movie too. And that's just how they all are. You can tell because the very concept of a woman doing something sm like confident and smart and interesting is like, whoa, like they're like, oh my God, look at this woman being powerful in, a, in, a, in an office. Like that is such an abstract concept to them that it's something to draw a lot of attention to. And it doesn't really work for the character. It does not work for the, I mean, you know, I guess it, maybe it worked in 92. Again, didn't read the reviews, not sure. Uh, does not work in a modern day context, very much ages it and it makes it really weird and uncomfortable. And really, a lot of her character is just a sex object for Batman, who has no character. There's nothing. The blandest Batman I've ever seen in my life. The most boring Batman of all time. Like, it, it, he has no, his only motivation is his horniness. He's so fucking horny. <laughs> There's a scene where the Catwoman has him like pinned down and she licks his face like a cat. And then he like slurps up the saliva off his lips. <laughs> that's, that's it, he just wants to fuck. And then he, you know, he's gonna solve crimes because he wants to solve some crimes, it's his thing. But he has no personal interests in anything except for f fucking uh, Selena Kyle. And he's just a 
boring, functional Bruce Wayne, someone to walk around and be the detective for these far more interesting characters. He's also straight up murdering people. He kills like two people, no questions asked. He sets this dude on fire and then he throws a dynamite down into this area and blows the guy up. And all of the controversy around Batman versus Superman, where it was like, oh, this Batman's a murderer. It's like, okay, but yeah, no, this Batman was also a murderer. Your favorite Michael Keaton Batman is a murderer now. So there you go. I mean, it's probably this Tim Burton-y, like it didn't actually kill him. It just turned his skin black and then he opens his white, uh, eyes and then you see like some the top of his hair is still like on fire and singeing and then he coughs up a single <gasps> pluff of smoke it's probably that time of explosion not a uh, fatal wound just darkens your skin and makes you blow out a puff of smoke yeah the the writing of this film there's some stuff that i liked in it you know it, it's it, there was a few there was like one line that actually made me laugh that I think was supposed to be a joke. He, it's it's a uh, someone looks at the newspaper with the penguin on it and then she he goes <laughs> she goes he's like a frog who became a prince and then the guy next to her goes no he's like a penguin and then it just cuts away from that conversation. <laughs> that was so that was that is such a like non joke. That is such a like bland, sarcastic, like matter of fact type of joke that it was just so dry. And I don't, I'm pretty sure that was just a funny joke that was supposed to titillate that sense of humor. And I like it and I'm here for it. <laughs> There's another interesting line that I wanted to talk about a little bit. When Catwoman is talking about how uh, some dudes are so sicko and horny and shit. And she's like, Sickos never scare me. At least they're committed. Because I'm a woman, and the one thing that scares me is a lack of commitment. Being stalked. Don't mind it as long as he wants to hold my hand at the wedding. Uh, as long as he wants to meet my parents, I don't care if he stands outside the window in a black mask. I think it's not a coincidence that they made the penguin basically into a, an ugly incel who tries to rise from the depths of his situation, who just gets like owned and shat on by a bunch of Chads and Stacys, you know? This was one moment in the film where I'm, I'm thinking I'm, you know, it's gonna be pretty interesting, uh, where Catwoman and Batman are sitting there, like they're talking at the ball and she's like talking about, I'm, I need to go kill this guy. He, number one, he's gonna like siphon off all of the, the city's power and then put him in a position where you'll have to pay him in order to have any power in, in the entire city and, uh, you know, manipulate the market and, and take advantage of the, you know, just become the sole capitalist monarch of this, of Gotham. And she's like, I have to go kill him. I have a gun. I'm going to go kill him. And she's like, and he's like, well, you know, if we're murderers, then we're no better than him. And it's like, well, it doesn't matter because all of this suffering is going to happen if we don't do something. And this is what I have to do. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. I like this kind of, you know, murder versus allow the bad guy to live dilemma. And then as they're getting close to saying something about it, the penguin blows a fucking hole in the floor and then floats up in a in a big rubber duck or something. <laughs> and it was like, okay, all right. Almost forgot what movie I was watching for a second. So it's, it's fucking ridiculous, but it gets a pass. And again, I would much rather watch this again than Batman 89. However, I am willing to say it's a worse movie because it's one of those things where most of the things I liked a lot about it, I'm questioning if they're even intentional. And the stuff that I really don't like, I know they were trying to do something else. And it's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not boring, which is, which is a big benefit for it. Uh, I, I laughed a lot more talking about it than I did talking about Batman 89. I will take weird and bad over boring and fine, but decent any day of the week. I'm excited for the next two, because uh, I'm definitely going to try to watch Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. I know that those go so far 
into the comedy and the, and the goofiness that they stop being fun. And I doubt they're going to have this same, like, uh, unnerving otherworldliness of the penguin stuff in here. So we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to hit that when we get to it. I had a great time with this one. Uh, yeah. Anyways, tell me your thoughts. Get down in the comment section. Yeah, comment again. I know you commented in the beginning to talk about your, you know, what word you felt. Now leave another comment. Leave two comments. Like it twice and subscribe twice. So <laughs> you can give me your opinion on on Batman Returns because I uh, I liked it well enough. <laughs> it was cool. Um, there was one thing I wanted to say. The line. Um, I don't know if you guys ever watched Nostalgia Critic back in the day, but in the Food Fight review, Nostalgia Critic rips off Catwoman's joke. This Catwoman, she walks into her door and says, Honey, I'm home. Oh, wait, I forgot I'm not married. And that was pretty, you know, it would have been funny if I didn't immediately think about Nostalgia Critic doing that. He ripped her off. What a hack that guy is, right? <laughs> Fuck that guy, dude. No, uh, he's, he's fine. I don't know. Did he do something? Did, did Nostalgia Critic get canceled for something? I feel like everyone just stopped liking his content one day. I don't know what he did. But I don't want to rewatch his stuff either. Maybe it's just it became cringe in the modern era. Whatever. <laughs> now, now everyone watches The Young Panda. So we're in a better, we're in a better spot. We're in a better world. Thank you for sticking by. Thank you for being a good friend. Thank you for coming around and watching this and listening and, and then commenting your, your, your favorite part of um, uh, the pizza. You like the, the core of the pizza or the crust. Are you like a big cheese guy? Tell me three comments, please. Yeah, I want your feelings. I want your feelings about Batman Return and I want your favorite pizza part. Okay, thank you. Goodbye. That's it.